going to talk about integrated marketing communications. And importantly, I want to emphasize that when we talk about marketing communications, we're not just talking about advertising. Very often, the focus is on advertising. And certainly, we're going to talk quite a bit about advertising. But in order for us to effectively communicate with our target audience, we need to have an integrated approach. So certainly, we're going to consider advertising. We're going to um, consider sales promotions, publicity, public relations, personal selling, direct mail. Very often, companies use all of those approaches to communicate with their target audience. Target audience, remember, is those that they want to reach with their messaging, with their communication. The target market is who they want to buy their product or service. Any questions about that? So again, it's not just about advertising. Yes, advertising is important. We're going to talk about that. You could take an entire course in that. I worked in advertising for a long time. It's important, but it's not the only aspect of marketing communication. And even within advertising, there's a lot of different mediums. And we're going to talk about that. But before we do, I just want to close the loop, if you will, on <coughs> where we left off last time as it relates to distribution. We talked about place. So as it relates to place, remember we talked about different channels of distribution? Does that sound familiar? We talked about mass merchants, department stores grocery stores, drug stores, convenience stores, wholesale clubs, specialty stores. And we talked about the different retailers that operate in those channels. And then we said that we need to decide, well, which channels are we going to sell our product? At which retailers are we going to sell our product? So we have to make a decision as executives, as marketers, as business people. It's our responsibility to decide. Because in order for us to get distribution, we're going to have to instruct our sales force. It's not going to just happen on its own. We're not going to just get distribution on the Walmart planogram by wishing and hoping, we have to have salespeople that are going to travel to Bentonville, Arkansas to meet with the buyer there for that department where our product would be sold and convince them to take our product into their stores. Now, that's very challenging because the buyers are interested in managing show space productivity. So they're looking at how many units they're selling for a given space. So for a given four foot section, most shelves are four feet. An entire aisle could be 20 feet or more, but in terms of how it's constructed, actually the shelves, most shelves are four feet. And so buyers are looking at for their section, whether it's a four foot section, with five shelves, or it's an eight-foot section, or a 12-foot section, or maybe this particular buyer for this category has an entire aisle. They're looking at show space productivity. They want to see how many units did they sell last week, this week? How many units did they sell for the last 52 weeks? How much dollars did that section and also that item generate? How much margin dollars did it generate? 
So all of those are metrics that they're going to use to evaluate the performance of that section. So they're going to evaluate the performance of an entire section, a shelf, and even the items. They want to see, are we selling fewer items over a given time period? And is there a reason for that? Is it because the item is seasonal? So it may seem like the number of units that we're selling is declining, but maybe that's for a good reason. Maybe because the product is seasonal. But regardless of the reason, there's an emphasis on category management, on this show space productivity. And so in order for our product to get on the Walmart planogram, and we talked about a planogram, planogram is the fixed layout for a given section. So part of the secret for success at retail has to do with the fact that they have a, a layout that's you could call um, turnkey, if you will. It's standardized, with some exceptions. Sometimes they have what's called regional planograms, but the layouts, in many cases, are standardized. So remember we talked about the visual theme at retail. What is the look and feel of the store? Do they play music? Is the paint on the wall orange? What type of lighting? What type of flooring? I remember we talked about the flow. I remember we talked about the flow at Ikea. Remember we said that we go round and round and round and how the flow is something that's very deliberate because retailers want to sell complementary products and accessories. What does that mean? What is that? What, what, what would be a good example of that? So we have this flow, which means that, let's say, for example, we come in here, then we walk this way, then we, they take us through here, through there. What is the retailer expecting to happen? Go ahead, Malinas. Um. So something for the home, or if it's the bedroom, you might think one section might be bedroom furniture. The next section might be what? Pillows. Then you walk down the other aisle, right? Because you can't go straight. It's like a dead end, right? You can't, that's it, so you have to turn left. And then what do they have? Sheets. And then you keep going this way, and then, oh, there's a wall, so you walk up that way. Or in clothing. So you come in one section, is where they had the pants. Then you walk down the next aisle. You can't go straight, so you turn right. What do you find there? Sweaters, shirts. You keep going up the, to the end of that aisle. You have to turn right, and what do you find there? Shoes, socks. That's very deliberate. That's an important part of retail <laughs> management, is the flow and also the visual theme. So that being said, we recognize that we need to decide the market coverage for our product. What is going to be our distribution strategy? So what are the, what's the options when we talk about market coverage? If we look at it on a continuum. it could be intensive. Now remember, if we decide that our market coverage strategy, our distribution strategy is intensive, what does that mean? 
What's the implication? Everywhere. What was that? It's everywhere. Josh, yeah. So Josh is saying, if our strategy is intensive, that means our intent is to sell our product everywhere. That's our goal. Now, the salespeople, <laughs> they're going to be crying because that's going to be a very big challenge for them. So if our strategy is intensive, if we're trying to achieve intensive market coverage, that means we're trying to sell our product in grocery stores, drug stores, convenience stores, specialty stores, department stores, mass merchants. And we should ask ourselves whether or not that's realistic. Does that make sense? So what do you think? Let's say, for example, we are talking about um, clothing. So what do you think? If, we're, if our business <coughs> is selling jeans, so we sell a line of jeans, torn jeans. Of course, they have to be torn, right? And some are more torn than others, which is sort of interesting, but I'm not going to go there. Um, are we going to, would that make sense to sell torn jeans in all channels of distribution? So would we sell jeans in grocery stores? What do you think? Does that, does that make sense? No. They, have, um, they sell things other than groceries in grocery stores. We call that scramble merchandising. Scramble merchandising is when you sell products that are not typical for your channel. Sometimes when retailers do that, it becomes typical for that channel. Like for example, look at all the products that you can buy at drugstores. Am I right? We, can, we sort of take that for granted. You could buy laundry detergent there. There, you, could, you might actually be able to buy a pair of torn jeans there. Because they have so much diversity in terms of their assortment. I know I've seen they sell t-shirts um, and a wide variety of um, products, other than what you might normally expect, health and beauty, A-type products, healthcare products. So besides aspirin and Tylenol and all of these other products, shampoo, right? Besides all those products, they, they sell t-shirts and I wouldn't, I really, I wouldn't be surprised if they, if they would sell jeans. There's probably some that, um, that do carry um, a small assortment of apparel, jeans and so forth. But that's very non-traditional. That's not what you would expect to find there. So we need to decide What's going to be consistent with the product that we're selling? What channel is going to be a logical match? What product do you think would be? So if you say, well, jeans, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't think we're going to sell jeans in grocery stores. Right, we just, we would just, that doesn't make sense. We'd just be wasting our time trying to get distribution there and then they're going to laugh at us, it's going to be embarrassing. Because remember, I told you it's important. We need to know our customer. We need to demonstrate that we know our customer. That's an important part of sales. You need to know what is the strategy of Walmart. We need to know, for example, that Walmart is an EDLP retailer. What is that? Everyday low price. So what does that suggest? How is that different from a high-low retailer? Who, who would be an example of a high-low retailer? Department stores, right? Department stores um, have sales all the time. Why? Because they carry the product at a high price and then lower it for sales. That's how we come up with that term, high-low. Whereas Walmart, they really don't, they don't run sales. It's their positioning in the marketplace 
their value proposition, their unique value, value proposition is what? That their prices are low every day. You don't need to wait for a sale. The price that you see, 747, which we described as what? What type of pricing is that? Odd even pricing? Or 948, that's the lowest price. Every day, low price, no sales. It doesn't mean that they're barred from having any type of promotion. Yeah, they could, they could have promotions. They're known for rollbacks. So as a salesperson, importantly, we need to design an offering for them that incorporates their rollback strategy. Which is what? That prices are going to continue to get lower. That not only is that the everyday low price, but that their promise is that they're continually striving to lower the prices even further. Do you ever see their commercials? Watch for falling prices? So that's known as a rollback. And when you go into stores, you'll see, let me do that again, you'll see that they have these um, danglers, shelf danglers, that'll say rollback. So when we want to try and get distribution in their store, we need to give them an offering that says, hey, we, we, we understand your strategy. We're going to sell it to you at this price the first year. And in the second year, we're going to lower the price that you buy it for. And in the third year, we're going to lower the price even further. Why? Because this way you can implement a rollback. So in the first year that the product is sold in their store, they're going to sell it for $297. The second year, we priced it so that they could sell it for $278. And then in the third year, we've lowered our price so that they could sell it at 254. That's sales. That shows you know your customer and you design a, a program that's relevant to their strategy. Now it's very different from a retailer who says, well I want to take in this product now and I'm going to sell it for let's say $50 and then I'm going to have a sale and I'm going to mark it down to $40. Then, three months later, I'm going to uh, mark it down to $35. Some retailers have sales all the time. Why do they do that? What's the logic behind having sales? What is it that they understand? What is it that, um, whether it's a sale or it's a rollback, <coughs> What is it that the retailers understand about the market? Why would they do that? No, Steven, right? No. Oh, my bad. Okay, tell me your name. Oh, Dimitri. Okay, go ahead. In an elastic market, if you lower the price, then more people will buy it. Yeah, so in a price-sensitive market, when you lower the price, people are going to buy more. So they're expecting when they lower the price that the number of units that they sell is going to go up. And that's why if you tell them that you want to raise the price of the product that you sell them, they're very reluctant. In fact, they're not going to accept a price increase because of what Dimitri just explained. They understand that Oh, wait a minute, so now you're going to tell me I'm going to raise the price from 248 to 274 Hell no! Because of what Dimitri just said. What's going to happen? I'm looking at shelf space productivity, and now you're telling me that I'm going to sell less units, obviously. My sales for that shelf, for that item, are going to be less. My margin dollars are going to be less. <coughs> but what would be a product that you think would make sense um, to have an intensive market coverage? Gum. gum. So, yeah, maybe, maybe gum. You could sell in department stores. Yeah. 
right? That's not their um, their main assortment, but they have um, food that they sell in department stores. They have um, you could buy coffee there. You could buy candy. That's not um, the main emphasis of their assortment, but you might you might be able to sell gum or um, orange juice, maybe. Right? You go to Bloomingdale's, right? So you go to Bloomingdale's, what do you expect? You go there, you have a glass of orange juice, and uh, <laughs> maybe a, a glass of milk. But those type of commodities, um, because uh, they have food service there, you might be able to sell um, those products there. They might be able to sell it in pretty much every channel. Pepsi, those, all those products. Again, even though Home Depot sells products to, for the home, that's their main product assortment, right? Snow blowers, sheetrock, nails, locks, all these kind of things, right? Yeah, but yeah, you could also you could buy you could buy candy there, you could buy Pepsi, you could buy lemonade. I don't think I saw orange juice there. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> I think in, um, it's, it might be in Lowe's, I think they have uh, small bottles of, um, I think, apple juice or, um, or lemonade. So, <laughs> so maybe, um, maybe those products would, be, would make sense to pursue an intensive market coverage. What is selective? What is selective? We say the market coverage is selective, means what? Um, say it again, Marina. And tell them in the specific selective places. And who wants to elaborate on that? Is it, go ahead, yeah. Well, like certain perfumes, let's say, they're selective in the sense that they'll only sell them to certain kinds of channels, but not to every channel, and not to just say one channel. Absolutely. So certain products are more expensive than others. Like. Some perfumes are more expensive than others. Some are $100 and some are $5. So what Gan is saying is that we're not going to sell, if our perfume is a $100 perfume, we're not going to sell it at Kmart. There's other things that we might want to buy at Kmart. Kmart is a nice store. There's things that we would buy there, but we wouldn't buy a $100 bottle of perfume there. Right? We wouldn't even look for a $100 bottle of perfume there, which is important because it's not just about where we want to sell our product. So if our um, perfume is $100 or more at retail, so we're going to try to get distribution at Bloomingdale's, Macy's, Nordstrom's, Neiman Marcus, Saks. Does that make sense? We're not going to want to sell our product at Kmart. Why? Why wouldn't we want to, you might say, but what if they want to carry it? What if they said, we want it, we want, we want to carry it? Well, you wouldn't really expect someone who's taking a lot of a person to go to Kmart, so it's like where the audience would actually go and find it. Yeah, so there's a couple of challenges. One of them is, um, what you're suggesting is that people are not going to go to Kmart to buy a product at that price, in other words, in that category. So it has to be where consumers, in this case, expect to find the product. And also, what about our positioning in the marketplace? Oh. Oh. It will change the positioning. Yeah, it's gonna, absolutely, it's going to change the positioning. So you're going to erode your brand equity as, what, a high-end luxury perfume. What do you think about Vera Wang selling wedding dresses in Kohl's? <laughs> right? Vera Wang is a high-end couture dressmaker. So you could have 
a wedding dress. Fellas, you guys pay attention because you're going to have to pay for this. <laughs> you're going to buy a wedding dress for your fiancé, soon-to-be wife, that costs $50,000 for a Vera Wang Couture Custom Wedding Dress. Now, what happens? So they also sell Vera Wang um, products at Kohl's because they're thinking, you know what? Maybe exclusive, maybe we need to transition from exclusive to selective or intensive distribution. So what happens? You go to the wedding, you're, it's your wedding day. It's your wedding day, and what happens? Somebody comes up to you and they say, I love your dress. That is crystal, that's amazing, wow. And then you say, and your husband is standing there, <laughs> right? And it's 50 grand later, and he's like, and you say very proudly, because you know that you paid 50,000, well, your fella paid $50,000 for the dress. Well, thank you, it's a Vera Wang. And your friend says, shop at Kohl's too. <laughs> you see, that's the problem. You can't be all things to all people. You have to be clearly positioned in the marketplace. Either you're a high-end luxury brand or you're not. It's one or the other. Go ahead, Annie. It's kind of similar to when the Sony made a, a design for Target, but they designed special things for Target, like you're not going to find the same thing at Saks, at Smithsonian, at Target, at Smithsonian. That's, they, um, as part of channel management, they try to do that. So um, just like whatever um, Ralph Lauren sells at Saks, they don't usually have at Macy's. So companies are aware of what we were just discussing, and so they try to manage that. Overall, will you still, is it possible you could still erode your positioning if you're a high-end Luxury brand? Yes. I mean, is it smoke and mirrors or is it, I mean, people, um, consumers are not naive. They know. What about um, Mercedes? Remember we talked about the Mercedes symbol and the tremendous amount of equity in that. Well, there's a big difference between buying a Mercedes for $130,000 and a Mercedes for $30,000. But what do both customers get? And we said that the only one who really knows the difference <laughs> is the gold thing is know that this is an S550, right? And this is a C class. So there's reasons why them doing that makes sense. From a manufacturing standpoint, it makes a lot of sense. From a marketing standpoint, it creates problems. So they sold, of course, why did they sell so many? You say, well, wait a minute, Coach, you're saying it's a dumb thing they did. But why, how come they sold, if it was so dumb, why did they sell so many cars at thirty thousand dollars. Because they still had the prestige of Mercedes, but their other car sales probably plummeted, like their hundred thousand dollar car sales. Right. So if you bought a car for one hundred thirty thousand dollars, and then what? You come to campus to see all your students are driving Mercedes, then you're like, oh no, that's <laughs> you got to get you got to get a Bentley, because now even the students, the, the students in college are driving Mercedes. So what Dimitri is saying is that, historically, this meant luxury automotive, $100,000 plus vehicle. And so from the first day, we talked about value, <coughs> perceived value. So what Dimitri is saying is that the perceived value is still very high. Then of course people realize, well, I know the car is smaller, 
I know the engine is smaller. I know it doesn't have leather seats. I know it doesn't have cherry mahogany wood paneling, but it's still a Benz, right? We're not, they're not being fooled, but there's still this association between that symbol, that brand, and high-end, high-priced luxury cars. And so the value, the perceived value, is very high. Remember we said value is a function of price, quality, benefits, and of course it could be other things, but those are three key um, aspects of value. So at that price, the perceived value is very high. So selective is going to be distribution at fewer stores in fewer channels. So intensive is basically we're going to try and sell our product in every channel, every retailer. That means that we're going to have to allocate our sales force accordingly. Selective is fewer channels, fewer retailers. And exclusive is going to be a limited distribution. Last time somebody had mentioned as an example the distribution strategy for the iPhone. Which was what? That they had an exclusive with AT&T. Questions? Sometimes we'll give an exclusive for a certain period of time. So for example, sometimes we'll introduce a product in the department store channel, which we know is sells products at a higher price, and sell it there for, let's say, a year and then distribute it, then open it up to other retailers, to mass merchants and specialty stores. So that exclusive might be for a limited period of time. What's the logic behind doing that? Yeah, but they're going to lower, they have to lower the price, right? Because uh, the new product is coming. Yeah, so they understand the adoption curve model. So they know that the innovators are going to buy the product at a high price at department stores. Once they sell to that group of consumers, then the question is, well, how then do we sell to the early adopters? How then do we sell to the early majority? Well, then we expand the channels of distribution. So then we start to sell it in specialty stores. Then we start to sell it in mass merchants. <laughs> then we give it to Walmart, Kmart, Target, Kohl's, So there's got to be an alignment between our strategy and the channels in which we're trying to sell. Does that make sense? So you see why we would do that. That ties back to what we talked about, the rate of adoption. How do we accelerate the rate of adoption? Well, we said one of the things we could do is lower the price. Well, department stores, they can lower their price, but if our pricing strategy is a skimming strategy and our intention is to deliberately lower the price over time in a planned way, then that means that we need to expand distribution into other channels that sell products at a lower price. It doesn't mean it's the identical product. Maybe it's a modified version of the product. Very often it would be. Because you don't want to embarrass your department store retailers by having the same product selling at Walmart for half the price, maybe. <coughs> what do you think about selling Rolex, $50,000 Rolex at Target? <laughs> no, you think that's doesn't think that's a good idea. Nobody, nobody, nobody goes to buy Rolex is at Target. How about a fifteen thousand dollar Breitling? Breitling is a nice watch, fifteen thousand dollars. What do you think, Target? I'm just checking. Just honest. I just want to check. Checking in. Checking in. I'm checking in. 
Questions? All right, so let's um, shift gears, if you will, and talk about integrated marketing communications. And yes, we're going to talk about advertising. So all of these are part of marketing communications. When we talk about advertising, we have to decide what media are we going to use to communicate. So what vehicle? So what are the, what are the choices for us? <coughs> So advertising, we're all so enamored with advertising. Where are we going to advertise? What are the, what's, what's the choice for us? TV, radio. TV. Manuals, papers. Radio. And these two are known um, as broadcast. Those are broadcast mediums. So we have TV, radio, and then? Newspapers. Newspapers. Okay, wait, I'm, I'm, I'm still on newspapers, now what? Yeah. The internet, yes. What else? Muscles. Film boys. Magazines. <laughs> internet, let's see. Um, billboards is a part of outdoor advertising. Yeah, on the buses. So, um, billboards and transit advertising. So, yeah, definitely on the side of buses, on trains. All of those are considered to be outdoor advertising. Yeah, word of mouth. Um, we're going to try to create um, some word of mouth. The question is, if that's our objective, how are we going to achieve that? Is it going to be through advertising? Is it going to be through sales promotion, publicity. So sure, we're going to try to create some, um, some word of mouth. Maybe it's um, part of promotions. Like for example, maybe we'll give um, free samples to try to create some buzz, to try to create some um, word of mouth. Let's see, what about um, street furniture? Do you know what street furniture is? This is also a type of outdoor advertising. Like on the side of buildings. What? What? <laughs> what? Like when they post up in our buildings, then like when you see the billboards at the bus station. Right, so billboards could be on the top of buildings, they could be on the side of buildings. Um, train stations, yeah, we could have posters um, there, definitely. What else? Go ahead, Dimitri. That's a question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so street furniture is, for example, like bus shelters, um, benches. So you probably, um, you're so used to seeing it, right, that you probably like block it out. Remember we talked about perceptual vigilance, perceptual defense. But, yeah, I mean, think about it. There's a bench. You walk down the street, there's a bench. Well, that's furniture. And um, the um, newspaper stands, which proliferate many cities, are a type of uh, street furniture. Why is this important? Why are we talking about street furniture, benches? Why? Because on those benches? Well, that's kind of like interesting that, oh, the city put a bench here. Okay? But there's a sign on it that says, call 1-800-LAWYER. That's advertising. So what we're talking about here is all of these things are options for us. So when we're going to advertise, we have to select a vehicle for communicating our messaging. How are we going to reach 
our target audience. Remember, our target audience is who we want to try to reach with our advertising. And the target market is who? Who we want to buy our product. So when we advertise, very often, the target audience is a subset of the target market. So if we're going to sell, right, if we're selling uh, this $100 bottle of perfume to women, so let's say it's a self-purchase, because the purchase can be either self or gift. And so our target market is women, but our target audience for this advertising campaign might be women that are between 18 and 29. See, our target market is all women from 18 to 90. That's our target market. That's who we want to buy our perfume. All women. All women in that age range. So it's a very broad range. But our target audience is going to be narrow. Why would we do that? Why does that make sense? Why would we, how is that going to impact our advertisement? It's not going to be the same commercial? She's so like, what do you mean? We make a commercial. The production might be a million dollars to produce the commercial. Why don't we just show it all day, all night, every channel? Why would, well that's true, because <laughs> you don't have an unlimited budget. What's the, what's the expectation from uh, that um, that we have. <coughs> like, let's say if you're selling a product to like women. I know this is going to sound really sexist, but like, let's say it's a cleaning product. You're probably going to show it between like certain hours because you know maybe certain like during soap operas, chances are you're going to see pro uh, commercials for like you know cleaning products more than I don't even know. Um, sports. Now we're on sports, right? It's kind of more common because you know that. Most likely, your commercial will be more effective, your ad will be more effective. So, what we're talking about here is reach. So, we're going to select the medium, and if, it's, if we decide it's going to be TV, then we're going to select specific day parts. That's what Yana is talking about, is day parts. And specific programming, so it might be in the, um, in the afternoon during general hospital, because you expect that that's when you can reach your target audience. So it's got to be very deliberate. Now mind you, I want to emphasize again that as part of marketing communications, it's not just advertising. We're going to continue to talk about advertising, but it's only one component of our communications plan, but still can be very important. And when we advertise, very often we use multiple vehicles, multiple mediums. So we're going to advertise on TV, we're going to advertise on radio, we're going to advertise in magazines, we're going to advertise in newspapers. And by the way, if we advertise in a magazine, right, if we decide to use that medium, that type of media, we don't just advertise in one magazine. Very often, to achieve reach, to achieve a high level of reach, we advertise in 10 or more magazines to get the highest level of coverage. Because maybe everybody who reads that magazine, although they're women, 
maybe they're not, what, between that age group that we're trying to reach. But in terms of developing the commercial, why would it matter? Why wouldn't we just run the same commercial all the time? Yeah, you're going to change the visual, you're going to change the messaging so that it's relevant to the target audience. So if you want to sell to college students or students that recently graduated from college, then who do you expect to see in the commercial? What's going to resonate with your target audience? Is it going to be somebody who's 65 years old? So for you ladies here, taking this college course, if you see a commercial for a perfume, a high-end <laughs> perfume for $100, and the person in the commercial is a woman that's 65, that you would say is at least 65, maybe 70 years old, is that gonna make you wanna buy that <laughs> perfume or not? I mean, it'd be even worse if it was me trying to sell it, right? But let's just say it was actually a woman, but the woman is like 70 years old. Milan, what do you think? I mean, is that... <laughs> so, we need to customize our commercials. We need to customize the print ads, for example. So reach is an important part of advertising. And frequency. Frequency is how many times, how often, on average, will our target audience be exposed to the ad? The greater the reach, the more expensive. So in terms of how media is priced, the greater the reach, the more expensive, the greater the frequency, the more expensive. So for example, it's much more expensive to run a commercial during the Super Bowl when you could reach 200 million people usually than it is at any other time because the reach is so high. And with magazines, in magazines we talk about circulation. What's the level of circulation? So for example, some magazines have a circulation of 1 million, and some magazines have a circulation of 5 million. Some magazines have a circulation of 8 million. And that's a realistic number in terms of circulation. So for magazines, <laughs> When we think about the level of reach, we don't, this, you never talk about like reaching 200 million people. With a given magazine, with one magazine, there's no, there's no way. There's no magazine that has that kind of circulation. So those numbers, like a magazine that has a circulation of 8 million, like um, Better Homes and Gardens, for example, then that's considered to be a very high level of reach. So 8 million in the world of magazines is considered to be a very high level of circulation, a very high level of reach. We need to be able to compare these different alternatives. So for example, remember I said as part of integrated marketing communication, we're going to advertise, we're going to have sales promotions, we're going to have publicity. What's the difference between publicity and advertising? Or are they the same? What do you think? Is advertising and publicity the same thing? No. It's not the same. Okay, so what's the difference? Publicity and bad publicity not done by you. Like, just because it's publicity doesn't mean that it's good. And sometimes it's not 
your opinion on what you feel about the product is someone else's opinion on what they feel about the product. Absolutely. So advertising is a paid form of communication from you. From us. We determine the messaging. We determine what's being said about our product. Publicity is free. And it's, it's somebody's opinion. Somebody who wrote, um, let's say, an article or is doing a story about the category or about our brand or our product. Now, although it's free, it sounds too good to be true, although it's free, what's the, what's the risk? What's the concern? Could be what was that? It may not always be good. Yeah, you have no control over what they say. They may say that um, your product is no good. That's just like you said, that's just their opinion. They're writing a story. They're writing an article. So publicity is an unpaid form of communication. The concern is that we have no control over what's being said. Now, it could be very effective. Publicity can be very effective, but um, as you're saying, it may not always be positive. We need to decide, let's say for an ad, between two publications. First of all, we have to decide what are the key elements of a print ad, for example. First is the headline. So how do we design a print ad? Well, we need to have a headline. Lose 20 pounds in two weeks. What's the purpose of the headline? Yeah, to get people's attention. You gotta get people's attention. You wanna create interest, desire, and action. What's the action? They're gonna buy our product. Or in direct response marketing, we get people to call and request a free sample or a catalog. Why is that effective? Why is that important? So we have a headline, and then we have an image. And then we have the body copy. And importantly, what else? What's like the most important thing in advertising? The single most important thing when we advertise? Yeah, we gotta have our logo. Our logo has got to be there. Mm -hmm. And if we have a symbol, we should include that as well. What should, what should I throw here? Pepsi. I'll make it easy on myself. I'll do the, the new Pepsi logo. And their symbol. Absolutely. I don't care what the headline is. I don't care what the image is, whether it's a photo, a drawing, you could use stock photography, so you don't have to take the photo yourself. So as part of production, sometimes we go into a studio, we take pictures of whatever it is, the shoes, the jeans. We must show the logo. Because nothing else matters. It doesn't matter what your headline is. It doesn't matter if your image creates stopping power so when we advertise, for example, in a magazine, people, how do people read magazines? You keep turning the pages, and then you see something that gets you to stop and read the ad. So it could be the headline, it could be the image. We need to create stopping power. Once we do that, we need to communicate our brand. That's essential. Otherwise, what are, we, what are we doing? If it wasn't for branding, well, there would be no advertising, because what would you talk about? Remember, we said that the brand is what differentiates one product from another. All products in the category, whether it's soda or cars, they provide the same functionality. 
They either provide transportation or they quench your thirst. Whatever the functionality is, whatever the benefit is, what makes one unique from the other is the brand. So it's critical to have any type of marketing communications that doesn't have the company's logo is a huge mistake. We need to have a brand champion in the organization. Because if they remember the headline, but they don't remember our brand, then we're wasting our money. It's essential that we create an association between that headline, the image, and our logo. Because remember, this is not something that's like one-off. We're thinking about the entire touch point map, the entire experience from the visual theme to the layout, every point of contact that our customer has with our organization. Whether it's online or in the magazine or on the TV, all of those things have got to be communicating the same identity, the same brand identity, the same look and feel, the same personality for our brand, the same brand image. So branding is extremely important. It shouldn't be just like off in the corner, like, okay, this is our logo over here. But well, why bother? That's ridiculous. Look at any ad. Very often, one of the most prominent things on the page is going to be the logo. Remember, what did we say the value of the Coke brand is? About $70 billion. That's why we're advertising. What's the basic objective? You don't even need to really write this in your advertising brief or your advertising plan or your marketing communications plan because it's so basic is to create brand awareness. Now, you could have other objectives like to reposition your brand, to position your brand as fun or contemporary or innovative. Those could be objectives for your communications plan. That could be a reason why you're advertising. But the most basic thing, basic, brand awareness. You have to create brand awareness, brand recognition, brand recall. So that's got to be a key takeaway from all of our marketing communications, whether it's part of sales promotion or direct mail. The emphasis is on the brand. So if you develop a print ad and don't include the logo, or the logo is not prominent or not visible, then we wasted our money. That's got to be the key takeaway. So after they <laughs> process the messaging, remember we have a certain message that we're trying to communicate. That gets encoded, basically. Right? So our messaging is encoded in that ad. The person that sees the ad, our target audience, is going to decode that message. And when they decode the message, what's got to be the takeaway? That's part of the communication process. So they learn the message and they associate that message or that image with our brand. The brand recall, the brand recognition. And our brand name is, how do we communicate our brand name? Well, we have a logo. That's the graphic representation of our brand name. Questions?